we come now to the Neanderthals. Everybody's heard of the Neanderthals, the arch-type cave people of ancient times. In this lecture, number six, we describe the Neanderthals of Europe and Asia who evolved from earlier archaic Homo sapiens populations well over a hundred thousand years ago. First, we're going to describe the distribution of the Neanderthals and the misleading stereotypes which surround them. Next, we'll summarize the salient anatomical features of the Neanderthals and conclude that they were nimble, efficient hunters. But they were different from us, from modern humans. And we'll look at the ways in which they were different. Then we'll examine their life way and the way in which they adapted to the harsh climate of late Ice Age Europe and Eurasia. We'll also describe the simple but versatile toolkit which they used to hunt animals and to process foods of every kind. And then finally, we'll discuss the Neanderthals' disposal of the dead, the first evidence of deliberate burial in prehistory and conclude that they did not have the powerful reasoning powers and intellectual potential of anatomically modern humans, Homo sapiens sapiens, ourselves. Cartoonists love the Neanderthals. They are the stereotypic cave people. They depict them as squat, club-wielding brutes, perennially dragging their wives around by their long hair. This misleading image comes from a portrait of the Neanderthals compiled from a single burial of a crippled man found a century ago. It is far from reality. In fact, the Neanderthals were strong, robustly built people with a few archaic anatomical features. The first Neanderthal remains came to light in the Neander Valley in Germany in 1856. With its heavy brow ridges and receding forehead, the Neanderthal seemed completely different from modern humans. It was the great Victorian biologist, Thomas Henry Huxley, who first introduced the Neanderthals to the world. He was an electric lecturer, well up to the standards of the teaching company, if not beyond them, he was brilliant, and also a very vivid writer. And his discussion of the rather primitive features of the Neanderthals made people think and put them in the mindset that the Neanderthals were little more than brutes. Since the first discovery of the Neanderthals a century and a half ago, Substantial numbers of Neanderthal individuals have come to light, most of them in Western and Central Europe, but also some examples from Southwestern Asia, Africa, and other parts of the Mediterranean world. It's important first to set the climatic scenario. Neanderthals first appeared during an interglacial period in Europe well before a hundred thousand years ago. They evolved from existing indigenous populations in Europe, archaic Homo sapiens populations. They were apparently few in number. There were very few of them on the ground. But then the Neanderthal population increased considerably after a hundred thousand years ago, because now we're coming into a period of about 50 or 80,000 years between 100,000 and somewhere around 40 to 30,000 years a year ago when these people flourished during a period of intense, intense cold. The last glacial period of the Ice Age, which began about 100,000 years ago and lasted right up to 15,000 years ago. This was not a deep freeze. It was a constant fluctuation of climate, but generally the climate was very much colder than it is today. In the 1930s, a great, great French paleontologist, Marcelin Boulle, painted a portrait of the Neanderthals which portrayed them 
as clumsy, shambling people, so specialized that they became extinct in the face of modern humans. Boole had very few samples to work with, and he based his ideas on an elderly, arthritic Neanderthal man found in a cave called La Chapelle Le Son in western France during the early years of the 20th century. I think it was in 1906. Boole was wrong. He described an atypical Neanderthal, one that suffered from chronic arthritis. The skeletons found in European caves may look like anatomical anachronisms, but they actually weren't. We have here a Neanderthal skull cast. And this cast shows some of the salient features of the Neanderthals. Look at the protruding prognathous face, the flat nose, the prominent brow ridges here, and the retreating forehead, and then the back of the skull, which, if you look at it carefully, is somewhat bun-shaped. Very different from that of a modern human with the high forehead and the less prognathous jaw. They look primitive. In fact, they were not. For example, they walked upright and as nimbly as modern humans. It's important to realize they were very, very mobile, fast-running, alert people. The European Neanderthal stood just over five feet tall. Their forearms were relatively short compared with those of modern people. This classic, very compact variety of Neanderthal is confined to Western Europe. This squat stature that they had, this shortness, this compactness, was an adaptation to extreme cold. You find the same form of body mass among people like the Inuit, adapted to the Arctic and its very severe climate. Their squat stature was an adaptation to the extreme cold of the late Ice Age. On the other hand, the Neanderthal populations around the shores of the Mediterranean and in Asia displayed much greater variety and variability and less extreme features, including less prominent brow ridges and more modern-looking skulls, which is something we're going to pick up on in the next lecture, the relationship between the Neanderthals and modern humans, Homo sapiens sapiens. All the Neanderthals, wherever they lived, however different they looked, had the same posture, manual abilities, abilities to make things, and range and characteristics of movements as modern people. They could run fast, they could squat, they could jump into a tree, they could stalk, they could lie on the ground, and so on. They differed in having shorter, more robust forearms, massive limb bones, the thighs and the forearm being a little bowed, which reflected the massive musculature of their bodies. They were shorter, bulkier, and more heavily muscled than ourselves. And oddly enough, their brain capacity was slightly larger. Opinions differ as to the ability of the Neanderthals to articulate fluently and to speak a language. But they were certainly capable of much more effective communication skills and speech than archaic Homo sapiens, their predecessors, and certainly more than Homo erectus. But it seems certain that they were not as articulate as ourselves. The roots of the Neanderthals in evolutionary terms lay in earlier times, 
not with Homo erectus, although obviously Homo erectus populations were the ultimate, ultimate atmosphere uh, ancestors, but in the anatomically slightly more advanced humans of more than 200,000 years ago, which we described in the previous lecture. Tough, nimble, and intelligent. The Neanderthals were expert hunters who adapted successfully to extremely cold climatic conditions during the late Ice Age. For the first time in prehistory here, you begin to see them behaving in the ways that we behaved. Although obviously there's a vast chasm between the way modern humans think and operated and those in which the ways in which the Neanderthals operated. This whole pattern, this Neanderthal anatomical pattern, appears to have appeared somewhere around 150,000 years ago, stabilized for about 100,000, before being replaced by anatomically modern humans within a mere 10,000 years after 40,000 years ago. According to British archaeologist Clive Gamble, the Neanderthals adapted differently to European conditions compared with their predecessors. They lived in caves and rock shelters, not in open camps so much, although they obviously used those as temporary stopping places when following migrating game or gathering plant foods. They certainly had fire. They used it with great efficiency. And it may well be that they used caves and rock shelters which gave them superior shelter during the very cold, long winters which would last up to nine months. Like their predecessors, the Neanderthals occupied large hunting territories of which they exploited different parts according to the seasons. They returned to the same locations year after year when game migrated or plant foods came into season. They were extremely skilled hunters compared with Homo erectus. They had to be because they lived in an extremely severe climate where plant foods were only available for a very short period of the spring, summer and fall. But, and this is a very important point, their hunting still depended on the use of game drives and close-up weapons. In many cases, if they could cooperate and drive animals over a cliff or into a swamp and thereby make them helpless, they could kill them at close quarters. Otherwise, they had to stalk these animals. And they had to stalk them so carefully that literally they were as close to the animal that they could touch it before they would drive a spear, hopefully into a vulnerable part. And we can be sure that a great deal of Neanderthal hunting involved chasing wounded animals. Today, we stand off at a distance and we shoot animals with a high-velocity rifle. In those days, if you wanted to kill a bison, say, you literally had to jump on its back to kill it. You had to get really close. This was really dangerous work. And it's no small surprise that many Neanderthal skeletons display serious wounds which were inflicted while hunting. Interestingly, many of these wounds look very similar to the injuries suffered by bullfighters. There was another difference too with earlier times. The Neanderthals were now developing hunting and gathering strategies based on four main herd animals. In fact, they were specializing a little more. These animals, all of them now except the red deer and reindeer, or these four animals now not common, the bison, the horse, the red deer, and the reindeer. Now much of their game meat 
must have come from culling seasonal migrations, as Eskimos still do in Alaska to this day. They preyed on the spring and fall movements when the animals moved from winter to summer pasture in movements that were highly predictable. The migration routes might change slightly, but the actual movement was predictable. This meant that the storage of meat, dried meat, for the winter months was of great, great importance. But in a climate where there was permafrost, where the subsoil was often permanently frozen, there was a very, very good way of preserving meat by refrigerating it. The Neanderthals were successful. By 50,000 years ago, population densities had ridden, risen considerably, and there was much more contact between neighbors. The landscape was filling in. Remember that if you're hunting and foraging, your landscape's never going to support more than, at the most, one person per square mile, usually less. So, as the landscape filled in, the densities were never going to be particularly high. But increasingly, as it did fill, there was more contact with neighboring bands. This reduced the amount of isolation. This also reduced the chances or the risks of bands dying out in times of stress. If, for example, the men in a band were killed on a bison hunt, the women could join another band because they knew of people within a reasonable range. It follows from this, as it had in earlier times, that environmental knowledge and larger group size were important to survival. This was a very difficult environment. Winters lasted up to nine months. These long, bitter winters of the late Ice Age caused many bands to settle in deep river valleys and other sheltered areas like those in southwestern France, the classic area of Stone Age studies in Europe, where huge rock shelters and sheltered caves abounded. Like their successors, Modern humans, the Neanderthals, tended to occupy south-facing caves so that they could get the full benefit of the winter sun. And from these winter bases, they fanned out in the open country to the north during the summer months. You should remember that at this time, Central Europe and Western Europe, from the Atlantic well into Eurasia, was a huge, treeless, undulating, open tundra where game herds wandered in the summer. But the Neanderthals were not well adapted to extreme cold, in the sense that they did not have the equipment to live out on open plains during sub-zero winters. Why? They didn't have the tailored clothing which was so important in later times. They probably moved there in the summer, and it's interesting that the most northerly encampments appear to be at about 54 degrees north, which is about the latitude of Lübeck in northern Germany. These people had limitations. They were highly mobile, but they lived in the winters, probably in more sheltered areas. The Neanderthals did not have a very elaborate culture. They had a very simple but versatile technology, but it was a technology far more sophisticated than that of their predecessors. It was first identified in a cave called Le Moustier, near Les Aisy in southwestern France in the 1870s. And since then, their culture, their material culture, has been known as the Mousterian, known to us almost entirely like so much other archaeology from stone tools. Now the Achillean hand axe makers, who had flourished for more than a million years, were skilled stone technicians. But their skills paled in comparison with those of the stone workers who developed over a hundred thousand years ago new ways of shaping stone cobbles or cores.
They would shape these cobbles, or these cores, very carefully before striking any flakes off them, so that you would get a standard size and shape of flake from which you could duplicate numerous tools, spearheads in particular. Spearheads with triangular shape and lethally sharp edges and points. And they would take a whole series of flakes off these cobbles before discarding them. Once they had got all these flakes, they would turn them not only into spear points, but into a wide variety of other tools. In short, there was much greater standardization of stone technology, but on the other hand, there was also a great, much greater variety of different tools. Projectile points, scrapers for working wood and scraping hides, knives for butchering. The Neanderthals were also expert at sharpening the edges of stone tools with careful trimming. They made some beautiful circular-edged or curved-edged scrapers, which must have been very durable because they trimmed the edge rather steeply to make a very tough, long-lasting working edge when scraping. They did another thing, too. They were the first people to make what archaeologists call composite tools. That's tools with several parts. They were the first people to mount stone spear points on wooden shafts. These made these weapons more lethal. Not only because they were sharper, more effective weapons at wounding, but also because very often when the point went into a car, a body, animal's body, the shaft would break off and the wound would therefore be more serious and more potentially fatal. But, despite their stoneworking skill, it seems that the Neanderthals made a relatively limited range of artifacts, which vary considerably from one site to the next. Now, there's great controversy over the meaning of these different toolkits. Some have small hand axes, which obviously are descended from much earlier versions of these artifacts. Others have little saw blades. Others have innumerable scrapers. And archaeologists have argued ad nauseam as to why these toolkits vary. And they vary greatly not only within the same area, but at the same location from one layer to another. Now, in earlier times, you found the Jame general toolkits over enormous areas. Very different, much simpler, much less sort of mental and technological versatility. Here, we see variability within an area and a site. What does it mean? Some people believe that different groups using different toolkits visited the same location at different times, maybe within a period of months, maybe at different seasons of the year. Other people believe that these changes are the result of cultural change, gradual cultural change over many thousands of years. An even smaller group of experts believe that these tools were the result of different activities by the same group. They might come to the site once and be processing hides. They would use scrapers. They might come at another time to woodwork and they would use serrated flakes to cut bark and wood. The fact of the matter is we will never know unless we start doing systematic edgeware analysis and are able to show what tools were used to cut hides, what for wood, and so on. This controversy is unresolved, despite lengthy and elaborate classifications of these artifacts by French archaeologists. In practice, all we can say is that the Neanderthals made a highly varied and simple toolkit for different activities, and they had the mental versatility to create slightly specialized toolkits for different tasks. And if they needed to scrape hides, they made lots of scrapers. They might even modify the scrapers for different types of skins. We don't know. Certainly, their toolkit was far more versatile and more efficient than that of earlier people. 
It's important to realize, and I shall stress this again and again, that at this period, about 100,000 years ago, or 75,000 years ago, and in this lecture we focused on Europe, we've glossed over many other parts of the world, the world's population was still teeny, perhaps numbering for the whole world, no more than 100,000 humans or so. All of them archaic Homo sapiens of various forms, of which perhaps the most extreme are the Neanderthals. But life is becoming more complex. For the first time, thanks to discoveries in Neanderthal caves, we know that the Neanderthals buried some of their dead. Why did they dispose of the dead? Did they have a belief in an afterlife? We know that they disposed of their dead because of discoveries in the floors of caves and rock shelters. One French rock shelter, La Ferrassi, yielded the remains of two adult Neanderthals and four children buried close together. Was this a result of a family dying in an accident or of a disease? We don't know. The graves themselves were simple, shallow pits usually covered with some stones. Was this formal burial? Or were the Neanderthals merely disposing of the corpses to get rid, or to protect the bodies from predators who, as in earlier times, abounded? We do not know whether the Neanderthals believed in an afterlife, engaged in any form of ritual, or possessed even simple spiritual beliefs. As we will see with modern humans, ritual became really important. It does not seem to have been important here. And the Neanderthals were among the last of the archaic humans, near moderns perhaps. But they lacked the awesome reasoning powers and logical thinking which mark Homo sapiens sapiens from its predecessors. Neanderthals in global terms, occupied a really relatively small part of the world. And they have assumed in the popular literature perhaps a far greater importance than they merit. But they're fascinating because they are the best known of archaic humans, and they draw us to one inescapable conclusion. That by about a hundred thousand years ago, humanity was versatile, nimble, and a tough, intelligent hunter and forager. It only lacked the fully articulate speech and the cognitive abilities which we associate with modern humans. These were humans, like ourselves, but they were different to us simply, mainly, because their cognitive and communication abilities were still Inferior. Inferior, perhaps, is the wrong world. Less developed might be a better term. But by the standards of modern humans, the Neanderthals had some limitations which prevented them colonizing extreme Arctic areas, developing tailored clothing, or the specialized toolkits, which are such a mark of modern humans. In this lecture, we've described their origins and their distribution, their anatomical characteristics, and shown that they were far from being brutes. Then we analyzed their simple but versatile toolkit and lifeway. We've said that they were confined to Europe, Eastern Eurasia, Western Eurasia, and also to Southwest Asia. And it was in Southeast Asia West Asia, that they first came in contact with modern humans. Because in the next lecture, we're going to tackle one of the most controversial and fundamental questions about human prehistory. And that is the question of where did modern humans, Homo sapiens sapiens, ourselves, originate? And how did we settle the world and replace the Neanderthals, which we did, because DNA analysis has shown that it was impossible for Neanderthals and modern humans to breed. This is the challenge 
for the next lecture.